All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Marvelous Music. I've got my coffee. I've got my water. They're over here, I swear. And today I've got Mr. Matthew Meadows once again, who, if you'll remember, was on our Creating a Score podcast just a few weeks back. So welcome, Matthew. It's, it's great to be here, Stephen. <laughs> I have to say, I feel like I I'm have just, to say I'm welcome because just... we're not actually in the same place. Right. I'm just thrilled to be here. Yeah, so this is cool because this is the first um, this is the first video podcast that we're doing. We've done a couple for uh, Marvelous Podcast now, but this is the first one I've had the chance to do it because we've been doing backlog episodes for me for a couple weeks now because my child decided to arrive early. Um, so she's upstairs. She probably won't be joining us today. Um, oh, but you might hear her in the background here and there. <laughs> But yeah, so due to being busy with babies and whatnot, uh, we had to we had to zoom in for today's episode. But I think it's going to be good. And uh, if you're a follower of the Marvelous channel in general, both the podcasts, you know we've entered into spooky season. I've been a week behind, but we are officially entering into spooky season today. Last Friday, uh, the Marvelous podcast did Halloween, the 2018 version, uh, a quick review of that. So today we're going to be talking about Halloween, the original from 1978. Um, the film that kicked off basically like the slasher genre, I would say, or at least brought it into the mainstream, because after that you have Friday the 13th, you have uh, Nightmare on Elm Street for like the unholy trinity of, of slashers of the 80s. Um, I mean, this was seventies, but they became like mega famous in the eighties, uh, throughout that time. And there's been many, many Halloween sequels. I almost tried to say a specific number. I think it got up to 10, 11, and then the zombie movies were 12 and 13, maybe there's a ton of them, but it all started from, uh, this really simple film of the original Halloween. And that's one of the things that struck me as we were rewatching it was just how, simple and sort of straightforward and clean cut this movie is like it's again it's something I said over and over again um in the last several episodes of my favorite films is they don't waste any space they're everything that's in them has to be in them uh and it's just incredibly like an efficient movie I guess you could say there's not a lot of fat on it um, so I really, really enjoyed this movie for that reason. And it's not, I almost think of it more as a suspense film than a horror film. Right. Um, cause it is, it builds the suspense really, really effectively. And it's not, there's a few jump scares here and there, but it's not the most, uh, just viscerally like horrifying film. But I will say this, I think it's a movie, the, the scariness of it, the tenseness of it, it kind of sticks with you. Um, like I was, uh, I was getting my mail last night and it was, it was night. It was dark. It was like 1030. I was getting my mail and I pulled up to where our mailboxes are and there's like street lights and it's dark, but there's no one out. And I could just hear like the music from this movie playing <laughs> in my head, or I would hear like those little synthy, like da -da -da, those little things yeah. I'm just looking around like, uh, okay, yeah, no, this is fine. I'm just, we're good. <laughs> right. Yeah, I even, so when I was watching this movie, I was watching it in my office uh, upstairs and I had it on my, I was watching on my phone uh, and this was at the, like the end of end of the movie kind of where uh, everything, all the killings start to happen and where Lori is like in the house uh, mm -hmm. and like the doors are opening and then my mom opened the door at the exact time that um, that the door opens for uh, what's her uh, Annie, uh, mm -hmm. whoever's in the closet. I can't remember which one is in the closet. Um, no, Annie's the one that was on the bed under the tombstone. Annie's on the bed. Uh, what's the other girl's name? I forgot. In my notes, I, I have her as blonde girl. Blonde girl. The when the blonde girl is in that uh, that cupboard. <laughs> And it, at the exact moment that the cupboard opens and you see her body and my mom opened the door to my office at that exact time. And I flipped out. I was like, this is, I wasn't scared. Like I, that, the movie wasn't super scary to me. It was like really suspenseful. Yeah. And that was just like terrible timing. <laughs> yeah. 
I feel like this is one of those movies that is great to watch by yourself when you can just kind of quietly be into the uneasiness of it. Or you, it's more fun to watch with someone that's like super jumpy and super scared. I think that's what makes the character of Michael Myers super interesting. It's because he, he just is like there. Mm. And you just like know that he's there. And it's like, you know that at any time something can happen. But there's so many scenes where it's just him standing there and like looking at Lori, um, which is scary enough. Uh, but like, I, I think that the tension, especially with like juxtaposition to like a modern horror movie, it's like you're expecting something to happen at every single second. And mm -hmm. when that doesn't happen, you're maybe a little bit like, OK, well, what is the like, what's the point of this? Yeah, well, you can even see that difference in if you take a second and compare this Halloween to the 2018 Halloween, you don't you don't even actually see him kill anybody in the original until the third act, right? In the in the remake yeah. from 2018, or I guess the sequel, you see him kill someone in the first act, like two or three people, because there's the people in the garage, there's you know uh, the person in the bathroom, like there's a few just quick right off the bat. Um, so it doesn't make you wait for him to start taking people down nearly as long, which is fine for that film. Yeah. And it makes more sense for that film. But it's interesting that in the original, you don't really see him do anything until that third act. You just kind of know he's capable of it and you're scared of it. Um, should we talk about you the music do. a little bit? Yeah, let's do it. I love how simple and sort of repeated this score is i could really only identify like three or four well, i'll call it three and a half different identifiable pieces of music through this whole thing you've got the michael theme which is the halloween theme that everyone's heard everyone kind of knows uh you've got Lori's theme which i didn't realize was called Lori's theme until i was doing some research after i watched it so in my notes i have it as like the stock stalking theme because it plays a lot yeah because yeah, it plays a lot like when you see Lori on screen but michael's watching her so um that's just what i wrote it down as and i knew what it was based on the what the title i gave it so it was fine <laughs> um right but yeah so you've got that piece and then there's sort of a rhythmic piano slash synth type piece they're all done with the same three to five instruments i would say but it's kind of repeated over and over again in that third act um and those are kind of the three main pieces of music and i thought what was interesting beyond that um you know obviously the the halloween theme is fairly repetitive it's that same sort of rhythm over and over again and it just kind of modulates down and then back up uh at the end of it and if you kind of take it apart musically, Lori's theme is taken straight out of the Halloween theme. Like they're all, yeah. it's same key, same structure. Um, it's slowed down a little bit, but it's the same notes with just skipping a few. Um, so really musically, it's taken out of that song to make this other one. So it fits perfectly with it. Um, and then same with that piece at the end, it stands alone a little bit more. It's not, um, the exact same notes, but it's, it's very, very close. It, it feels similar enough. And I think that's kind of the, the, the goal with this too. It all feels similar enough that you're like, okay, well now what, okay, well, this, this is this, but it's not like, is something going to happen now? Like it's this other song, but it's not the same exact song. So it's like, I think that attributes to some of the uneasiness of that. It's like, okay, well, I'm hearing Lori's theme. I only know that from when Michael's on screen. So I have to assume that something is going to happen. And then it doesn't a lot of times. There's no, like, again, like there's no immediate payoff for that. And you're like, well, what was, like, what was that about? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think that... So there's something really interesting that I noticed. Um, in the first two acts of the film, you pretty much only get music 
when Michael is around, whether he's on screen or whether you know he's there because of the camera angle and like, or if they're talking about him, if a couple characters are talking about right. him. That's the only time you hear music. Um, when it's quiet, nothing's really happening or it's kind of those filler scenes where you're seeing Lori interact with her friends, different stuff like that. You're getting exposition. So the movie almost conditions you in the first two acts to be comfortable with silence. And then when there's music, you're a little bit more on edge, like, okay, he's here. Let's, you know, pay attention. Um, but then in the third act, they subvert that and they have silence in the score in several moments yeah. where you know Michael is there, specifically when he's in the the friend's house where he does the first several murders. Um, in that house, you know he's in there and it's silent when like Lori gets there or it's silent, you know, as she's looking right. around in there. And it's so uneasy because now you're like, okay, I was supposed to feel safe when it's quiet because <laughs> right. we only get music when he's around. So I should feel fine now, but I know he's here. So then by the end, and that's part of, I think, why, like what we were saying earlier, where the movie does a great job of building tension. This is just another piece of that where it builds up a sense of comfort in a certain thing through the film. And then you get to the climax of the film when everything's about to pop off and you know it's about to pop off and it takes that one comforting thing away from you and you just have no right. idea what's going to happen. And I loved that. Yeah. Did you notice that at all? Yeah, I think it's that scene at the beginning of the movie where they take Michael to that like hospital or whatever. And the guy goes like, you fooled them, haven't you, Michael? It's like, it's like silent there too. Um, and so that's something that was that really stood out to me. But back to your your point about the third act, I think that is if that was if that wasn't the case, I don't know if that's as scary as it is. Um because that scene, that scene where um, he's breaking down the door of the closet, uh, I don't remember there being, I don't know if there's music there. Like, I don't remember, but I feel like that, that even thinking about that, like, stresses me out. Mm -hmm. Like, thinking about that exact scene is like, oh my gosh. And she's like cur curled up in the corner. And it's like, so that whole act, like all of the all of the choices that are made, like score wise, acting wise, lighting wise, like they just come together in this really like intense fifteen minutes. <laughs> yeah, and it's like which is crazy that it's so well done and it's so good at that. Like it's so good at building tension, taking away tension, building tension, taking away tension. And when you say, like, like you said, when they subvert the the score and the silence, it's like, okay, well, now I'm tense the whole time. And this 20 minutes is now the longest 20 minutes of my life because yeah. I, I know that something is going to happen. Yeah. Um, I think another really interesting thing with the score is like the film, because again, a good score parallels and contrasts the film so that it brings out what it needs to bring out. Um, and in this one, I want to say nothing ever really resolves in a satisfying way in the score. And the between the baseline and the melodies of each uh, piece of music, it's very dissonant, um, like just a lot of notes on top of each other that, you know, shouldn't be there if you're wanting to make anything sound happy at all um so there's just always right. but it's not like it's not like a a jumbled mess it's very simple and there's just dissonant chords through the whole thing it's not unpleasant to listen to it's just not resolved major you know stuff um and i think it's interesting that it's like that through the whole film all the themes, everything's dissonant, nothing ever really resolves at the end of the music. And in the same way, you know, Loomis looks over the edge at the end and Michael is gone. And so you don't even get a resolution to the tension of the film 
because even though you know Lori and Loomis survive, you flash across all these different scenes of all these different places in Haddonfield, and you can hear him breathing, and you're like, you, okay, he's still around. This is going to happen again. Yeah. So you don't even get that satisfaction at the end of like, oh, he's dead. Um, you just have this continued uneasiness, and maybe that's maybe that's something that is more accurate of this movie than calling it scary is it's uneasy and it leaves you uneasy. It doesn't leave you terrified. So like the uneasiness that you get throughout the movie and like in the, in the tracks stays with you after you, the movie stops. Like, Mm -hmm. and like we were talking about earlier, how you went outside and you were like, uh, is he like, am I crazy? (laughs) Or is like, or am I feeling like, scared (laughs) it's like am i wrong or it was like is it actually happening um and i like and i felt the same way and i think that i think that's the sign of a really good movie is that it stays with you at the end Mm -hmm. um and the and the score and the, the resolution the resolution of the movie where loomis again looks over the the edge and he's gone i'm like what how do you I guess, and and also it sets that up though, because it's like you can't kill the boogeyman, um, yeah. Which is like, yeah, but it's like, like yeah, like I was saying, you just stay so uneasy, and I think that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's it's insanely effective. I think. Um, so I just did a mini episode on the YouTube channel. Uh, released it last week and i kind of put the the marvel movies on blast for having really crappy scores um or not having crappy scores but just having scores that don't blend together and they don't like iron man 2 doesn't use any of the same music from iron man 1 and iron man 3 doesn't use any of the same music as the first two and so i i have a huge problem with the mcu and how they've you know, not, they have no musical continuity whatsoever. And uh, to even drill further into that, in a lot of those films, there aren't a lot of repeatable themes that you could really latch onto and kind of like hum or remember. Um, Not so with this movie. And it's interesting because, because it is such a simple theme. It's not like this grandiose, like Superman theme or, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark or anything like that. It's very simple, very stripped back. It's only a few instruments. Um, you may not recognize the exact piece of music from the movie, but because they all use the same very few instruments as they do in the first um, like opening theme, I feel like any piece of music from Halloween, you could recognize as being from Halloween, even if you don't know the exact piece of music or where it sits in the movie. Absolutely. I absolutely think that's true. Um, and and we, we talked about it too. It's like, it's all the same notes. Like mm-hmm. it's all the same song, just a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and so you would, anybody could forgive you for being like, oh, that's the Halloween theme when it's playing that like, the rhythmic piano at the end is like oh that's the halloween theme it's like no it's it's act three <laughs> finale theme or whatever it's called it's like, right <laughs> I, it's, right and so like, <laughs> I, I it makes sense to me that that would be that that's kind of like the perception of the movie yeah um yeah overall like i had a really good time with the movie watching it this time and i had a really good time looking at it with the score in mind because the score is really simple it's yeah. really easy to digest i feel like this is a great intro horror movie like if you have an interest in watching horror movies and you haven't watched any or very many beforehand maybe you're just like okay well it's october and i want to you know watch something spooky I feel like this is a good intro horror movie because it is more on the suspense right. uneasiness side of the horror movie genre than on the all out jump scare. I'm terrified type thing, which I think the the Halloween remake kind of fits more into that camp. Um, yeah. 
but the original is much more uneasy tension, you know, and then it's a little, it's scary at the end, but yeah, I think it's a good intro. But it prepares sure. you for that. Yes. Like it, it, it prepares you for that scariness. You know like, what's I coming. Hate, I don't like horror movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do not enjoy watching horror movies. I do not like to be scared. I enjoyed this movie. I really did. I, I think, and I think it's exactly that reason. I, I, I don't, I don't do, I don't get like the wanting to be terrified the whole time. Like that's not something that I enjoy, but I do like to be like on edge. And like, I like to be like, oh, what's going to happen now? Um, I love that. Like all of my favorite movies have that in it. Mm. And so it's like, it make like, I really enjoy this movie for that exact reason. And, and I think, like you said, it's a great, like, a great intro horror movie but it's also just a fun it's like a good movie to watch it's just a good movie um, yeah and it's a classic for a reason right like people talk about this movie as like the father of horror movies for a reason it's like mm -hmm. it it did a lot for the genre and even outside of horror it did a lot for i think just the drama or like the whatever like whatever genre you can think of i think this movie has a lot of like has a lot of play in in that conversation too. It's like, oh, all these all these movies have like, oh, that was something like that was kind of in Halloween, or like that was kind of like this thing in Halloween, you know? Yeah. Like, I think I think that's really cool, and the, and the mark of a really good movie. I think you could even argue that the score had a huge impact on horror film scores in particular moving forward. Because as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking of like uh, Friday the Thirteenth. That's a very synth heavy, but stripped back sort of minimal score. So is, so is Nightmare on Elm Street. That's a very synthy score. Yeah. Uh, Hellraiser, um, a few of those, a few of those 80s slashers, like uh, uh, even uh, what did I watch last year? The Hills Have Eyes. That has those, that same kind of like synth pop uh, when stuff happens. Yeah. Um, so I think even the score was very, which John Carpenter did his own score for this, which is really cool. Um, uh, I think that's yeah. so cool that a director scored his own film and did it so capably. Right. And I think it, you can see why the score, even though simple works so well with the film, because the person who directed and created the movie also created yeah. the music going with it. It's all in the same mental space, you know? I think that he had a very specific idea of what he wanted to do mm -hmm. and, and the score and the silence and the, you can even hear like, you know, like older movies have like the, like the kind of like static noise in the back sometimes. Yeah. Like there's a couple of scenes where you can hear that and it's like, Oh, that even feels like it's supposed to be there. Um, and it, it's like, I, I think, I think any, with any creative project though, it's like anybody who has like this vision is going to do what they want to do to make that happen and if my goal is i want this movie to be tense and i want there to be zero resolution at the at the end of the movie i'm going to make sure the score aligns with that goal and yeah. it does incredibly well yeah i 100 percent agree i actually had that as a note is you know especially in older movies there's a lot of silence where there's no music underneath of it but i think it's just because they didn't put music underneath of it, not because it was an intentional choice. Right. All the silence in this movie feels intentional. Yeah, dude, like I like I said it earlier, that scene where he's looking out the window just sets you up for this. You know, it's about to be like insane. Yeah, like you know that this is going to be a really like that this person is going to be the worst person you've ever like seen in your life. Like you just feel it. Um, and it's it's cool and also we didn't talk about this the face reveal like his reveal at the end he's just a normal dude i always forget like, that and, that's like there. and that's what i right yeah and i think that that's that's so powerful too because like oh i wanted him to be this like monster or like this yeah. like i you know what i mean like i wanted him to look like he'd be a bad person but he just think, is a normal dude do you think that that's part of the do you think that's part of what makes him so scary in that once it's revealed that he's just a dude, because <laughs> you actually kind of see his face when he steals the car at the beginning too, because you get a pretty well lit yeah. shot of him climbing over the car. Um, 
I feel like part of what's scary is that he could be anyone under there. Like, right. You can yeah. put, Oh, I got chills. <laughs> and I, and I'm wondering it, like, as people watch that, like you could put anyone under that mask, you know, anyone could be under that mask walking towards you, watching you from behind the bush, like whatever, that could be literally anybody. And I do wonder, I don't think that's intentional. So I'm not, I'm not going to go out on that limb and say that that's like part of, you know, what the director had in mind, but that's just kind of a right. thought that I'm having that, that to me is something that's, that's creepy about it is he's not some monster. You want to kind of dehumanize him because he does have the mask the whole time. He's yeah. just a scary guy. Um, but when you actually just see, oh, this is a guy, but I like nothing can stop him. Nothing can kill him. He's just continues to be there and continues to try to harm me. Like, I don't know. You could fill yeah. in the blank with anybody. And that's, I think that is kind of potentially part of what's really, really scary about it. <laughs> yeah. And also you, you forget that he was a, like, he was a kid at the beginning of the movie, right? Like you forget that he is that kid that killed his sister. Yeah. You know, it's like, and you, you like you forget that and then and then as it goes on and loomis even talks about like i've been with him for 15 years and it's like like oh this isn't new for him like this is not mm -hmm. like he's thought about this like he's he's thought about this denied any like help and thought about this and is gonna do whatever he can to make sure it happens mm -hmm. and that's that's even that's so crazy too yeah because <laughs> he was it, he was in that that like whatever like hospital for such a long time breaks out on that on that specific day and you know he's he's been like and Luba says it too he's like he's been thinking about this for such a long time or something like that like he's planned this out and that's just so creepy to me too yeah it all is just really like once you start thinking about all of it like together mm -hmm. it's like it's so much <laughs> Well, and what I love about the original Halloween and the newer ones with Jamie Lee Curtis, um, and and I think this is why they ended up cutting out two through X, I guess. Um, and even in contrast to like the Rob Zombie movies, they seek to explain like why he was crazy in the first place or like why he was, I shouldn't say crazy, that's derogative but why he was the way he was in the first place. Um, or they try to explain what triggered him to escape on that specific night. Like in the zombie movie, I think it's um, because Loomis had kind of, Loomis became a much more jaded character and a much more um, opportunistic character. So he was trying to make money off of like selling a book about Michael. So that's how right. they kind of explained like Michael was triggered into attacking on that specific Halloween, but in the original, and I think this is a strength, is the ambiguity of like what set him off on this specific Halloween, because right. it's 15 years later, there's nothing significant about a 15 year gap, you know, it's, and I think that that ambiguity is part of what makes it so scary because you don't know why he did what he did when he was a kid, why he murdered his sister. And then you have no idea why he needed to return and kill again on this random Halloween night, 15 years later. Yeah, And that's why sequels maintain the power that they have if they leave it ambiguous is you just don't know why he's doing what he's doing. Yeah. And you don't need to know that to be... Mm -mm like scared of it no not at all yeah it's like like yeah i i i don't care like i just don't want him to get me yeah so i do have to fact check two things about this movie because i grew up in southern illinois in a small town that you could very much compare to haddonfield so that's part of why this movie is creepy to me because i see haddonfield and i'm like oh that was where i lived <laughs> um so two things at the very beginning of the movie, after you get the, the zoom in on the pumpkin and the Halloween theme and remind me to come back to that. Cause I have a note about that. Um, but the pumpkin. first shot, yeah. But the first shot, it opens up okay. and there's no music, but you can hear morning doves. And that's like very Illinois. Like you hear morning doves 
every day in Illinois. And it made me feel like I was home, which was really sweet. Um, and then people started dying, which, you know, right. whatever. But uh, the second thing, there's a very quick scene when Loomis discovers the mechanic that Michael kills to get the, the overalls. Um, and he's in the phone booth next to the train track. And it's a wide shot. At least when he gets out, it's a wide shot. And there's just these like rolling hills and it's not Illinois. Like that's clearly, I think it might be Southern California. But I saw the hills and I was like, yeah. they didn't shoot like, this ah, in Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> there are not hills like this in Illinois. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and those are two. I didn't, even, I didn't even think about that. Those are two fact checks from someone who grew up in a town like Haddonfield. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but the pumpkin. Um, Dude, yeah. yeah. So I was, um, I was watching a video the other day. It was a Patrick Willems video. I don't know if you know who that is, but he does film analysis and whatnot. He was talking about like opening credits and why he thinks they should bring back like the artistically cool opening credits in movies. Uh, and he talked about overtures and in Halloween, you essentially get an overture since all the music comes from that theme and it's just the opening credits and there's a pumpkin and the Halloween theme is playing or Michael's theme is playing and it's zooming in on the pumpkin. And I feel like, and maybe this was intentional, maybe it wasn't, but to me, as I was watching that, having seen it a few times, I was like, this is, um, this is symbolic of the Michael My Myers character, just the constantly moving closer of the camera movement the constantly getting darker as the shot goes on and then the constant lowering modulation of the music because it changes keys um, to lower yeah. and lower keys uh, as the theme continues. And then it picks back up at the, at the end, but you know, whatever. And I thought, is this, I wonder if this was intentional, if this was supposed to be indicative of the character and kind of the whole movie as it continues to go downward, downward, downward as he continues to move closer and closer and closer to his target. Right. And I, I think you could probably say that. And, but, and I think I, like, I don't know if that's intentional. Yeah. But like, but I do see what you're saying. It's also funny. Cause like, it's the house that he, he kills all the people in at the end, there's a pumpkin on the front porch mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, Oh, that makes sense. Like, of course there is. And like, they were carving a pumpkin. And it's like, there's just pumpkins everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I like, yeah, dude, I don't know. It's the, the character, Michael Myers, right. As a whole is so, and we, again, that ambiguity about it, but it's so good. Like, it's so simple. Mm -hmm. Like he's just around, like, yeah, he's just there. And like, and I, th I think the, the constant getting closer is, is, the, is something too. Because, well, the first time, like, a lot of times he's just, like, in passing, like, in the car. Like, he's passing by. Or, like, in the backyard, he's super close, but, like, he's gone in, like, a second. The other times, like, you see him towards the end, it's the kid sees him out the window of the house. Mm -hmm. And he's just there. Like, he's not, like, doing it. And he was carrying Annie inside. It's just, like, he's not, like he's not like disappearing or anything. He's just like doing his thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that makes you like kind of think of like, oh, was he doing that the whole time? Like was, cause in my head, he's just like there, but in reality, he's still around and still doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, that was something else I was thinking about too. It's like, what was he do? Like, what was he planning? Like, was he just yeah. like, was he there the whole time? And we only saw him like f five or six times. Was he there the whole time? And we just didn't know. Like, that's what I started thinking about towards the end of the movie. Yeah. I was like, what okay. was he doing? He knew it. He knew exactly what to do, exactly when to do it, knew exactly where people would be. Like the thing with Annie, like in the car. Like he had to have like a like tap the phone wire or something, right? Like <laughs> how else would he know if he wasn't just there and listening? Yeah. yeah. Well, and you saw like he was outside the window because the dog was barking at him. Dude, he was yeah outside the window just 
watching and listening like so you have to figure that yeah. he was doing that the whole time to various people yeah that's so creepy too yeah. oh oh it I don't, is i don't like it's that, uneasy actually. i don't want to think about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah any other yeah, any I, other thoughts on the music so good. or the score i think i think my last thing is like that like rhythmic piano at the end like mm -hmm. the dun 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 that's in everything like that kind of style is in everything like even our play that we did we did yeah. that I'm like we did. it's there it it's like that that one thing and this is more of like a like a broader thing it's like that one theme and that one kind of like um what's the word kind of like trope i guess like mm -hmm to have that like that kind of thing is in every horror movie it's in every like suspenseful movie that stuff and that's so like imagine writing something like that and then it being like the inspiration for everything to come <laughs> yeah well and i think what i think that takes this so one cool. even a step further that piano rhythm at the end i believe it's in five four time which is like very wonky um because it has a, a hesitation in the middle of the beats. So I'm pretty sure it's in 5-4, which just kind of adds to this, like, I can't even settle into the rhythm of this music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's so cool. It's so well done. Yeah, it truly is. Um, so if you haven't seen Halloween, you should watch Halloween. It is absolutely the classic that everybody says it is. Hopefully this kind of gives you, hopefully this sets the expectation for you uh, as you go into watching it. Do check out the music. This is what I encourage you to do every time you watch a new movie or, or something is to watch it with the score in mind and figure out what the score is doing because it'll probably help you understand the movie more and it'll probably help you enjoy the movie more. And especially in this one where the score is so integrated into it, it definitely will. Yeah. Um, so with that, Matthew, thanks for doing this. Thanks for gritting your teeth through a horror movie for me. I appreciate it. Uh, anything for you, Stephen. <laughs> and uh, with that, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.